The movie's events begin in Venice. A dark-skinned man arrives at an event where people in carnival costumes are gathered at the entrance of a building. Once inside, he contacts his team, a girl waiting on a boat in one of the canals. However, he gets distracted by a man with a cane offering a free carnival mask, which he declines. He then meets up with a female security guard in the auction hall and takes his seat marked 1305 Italy. The auction is taking place simultaneously in two cities, physically in Venice and online in London. In the hall, the man continues to communicate with his team in London, a man on a boat who has reached the designated spot on the Thames and a male security guard. At this moment in Venice, Interpol is watching them from a neighboring building, works by the digital artist N8, who prefers to remain anonymous but decided to personally participate in the sale of his NFT this time, are up for auction in the hall. Meanwhile, through the cameras, Interpol spots the man in the hall, Cyrus. The agent can't figure out his intentions or why he isn't trying to hide from them. A self-portrait mask by N8, made up of 482 cameras allowing for a unique NFT creation, is brought out. Bidding starts, and Cyrus makes the first bid at 12 million. The agent watching the cameras is surprised by where he got such money. She requests the details of seat 1305 and discovers they are fake. He's not John Bretley. She realizes Cyrus knows they are being watched. At this moment, he looks directly at the camera, confirming her suspicions. Meanwhile, bidding in the hall intensifies, and the man raises the bid to 20 million. The host starts the countdown, the bid wins, and Cyrus gives the command to rob his people. An alarm sounds, the lights go out, and people hurriedly leave the hall. Interpol agents realize something has started and rush to the auction location. In London, a siren also sounds in the hall, and everyone is asked to leave the building. While people are exiting, the security man from the team, using a glove mimicking the data of an employee, opens the art storage. In Venice, a female security guard approaches the artist N8, offering to take him to a safe place. However, Cyrus stops her. He's upset that he won the auction but hasn't received the NFT, and suggests N8 come with him to his yacht to complete the money transfer. The artist agrees, and they leave. Interpol rushes into the building. An agent approaches the nearest auction guard and orders all exits to be blocked, suspecting a robbery is about to occur. Meanwhile, in London, the security guy retrieves a painting by Van Gogh from the storage. After getting the artist and eight out of the building, they get on a boat which, according to Cyrus, leads to the yacht. In the hall, the agent finds a golden mask. Connecting with her partner, she assumes that Cyrus decided to steal the NFT and kidnap its creator. In London, after putting the painting in a tube, the guy throws it into the Thames, where it is intercepted by an accomplice. The team with N8 heads towards the yacht. The agent spots them from the shore and begins to chase after them. The female security guard activates a fire alarm using her glasses. A fireboat emerges and blocks the canal, forcing the agent to disembark and find another boat. After finding one, she continues the chase. Out at sea, still through the glasses, the girl activates the floating walls. The boats race forward at high speed. Suddenly, the activated floating walls start rising from the water. Cyrus's team manages to pass through the last wall before it fully rises, but the agent doesn't make it. Once on the yacht, Cyrus asks N8 to remove the mask. They finalize the deal and throw a party to celebrate their success. Meanwhile, Interpol agents review the auction footage and find another suspicious person, a man with a cane. The agent orders to find him. The news is buzzing with reports of the contemporary artist's kidnapping. As N8 recovers from the party's aftermath, he's taken aback to find himself the center of media attention, struggling to comprehend why he was targeted. Cyrus then shares the tale of the Mona Lisa painting, once an obscure piece valued at a mere $25,000, its notoriety skyrocketed after being stolen, and it's now worth a staggering $860 million. Drawing inspiration from this, they orchestrated N8's kidnapping. While the world believed he was abducted, the value of his painting surged, culminating in the sale of his NFT for an astounding $89 million. Overwhelmed with disbelief, the artist is ecstatic. They toast to their triumphant scheme, but Cyrus suddenly remembers Denton, another member of their team. At this time, the agent interrogates the man with the cane they found, but he takes everything humorously, refuses to cooperate, and says that Oliver has all the answers to their questions. During the interrogation, a package is brought to her containing an auction tag, a book by John Bretley, and photos of her hugging Cyrus. After reviewing the contents, she decides to return to London. In London, at the Interpol building, Agent Gladwell summons a colleague from the adjacent department to her office. He proposes brokering a deal with Cyrus, but she vehemently opposes the idea, concerned that such cooperation would undermine a year's worth of her investigative efforts. He then provides her with information on Lars Jorgensen. Once an ordinary banker, he began sponsoring terrorists and engaging in stock market manipulation. 
His actions led to significant wealth accumulation at the expense of countless lives. For instance, Jorgensen profited from a plane crash in New Zealand that caused numerous deaths and a subsequent drop in airline stocks. Interpol has been trying to apprehend him for years, but concrete evidence has always been elusive. Now, with the arrest of Arthur Tigg, a former associate of Lars, they have a lead. Tigg communicated with the hacker group Leviathan, who are planning a catastrophic attack on dams and communication systems, exploiting the reliance on computerization. If successful, these attacks could devastate entire cities, potentially causing millions of deaths, while Jorgensen stands to profit billions. Although the timing of Leviathan's plan remains unknown, Tig revealed that Jorgensen promised them half a billion dollars in gold. Jorgensen plans to send the gold via plane in 17 days, and since the shipment is legally sanctioned, intercepting it is not an option. Agent Gladwell grasps her colleague's intentions but remains steadfastly against the proposal. She argues that Cyrus, a seasoned thief and habitual liar, is untrustworthy. Nevertheless, her colleague insists that she must secure Cyrus's cooperation. Meanwhile, Cyrus is swimming in a pool when the same book by John Bretley, featuring the photograph from the intercepted package, sinks to the bottom. Upon resurfacing, he notices Agent Abby waiting for him. When she arrives at his location, she informs him that he stole a Van Gogh painting, a buyer has been identified, and one of his team members has been compromised. Cyrus dismisses her claims, suggesting her bitterness stems from their unsuccessful romantic dalliance in Paris. Abby vehemently denies this, clarifying her purpose for the visit. Frustrated, Cyrus questions her motive. In response, Agent Abby proposes a collaboration. They need to steal half a billion dollars worth of gold from Lars. Cyrus initially declines, asserting that stealing from individuals like Jorgensen is morally objectionable. However, Abby presents him with an ultimatum, face imprisonment or cooperate. Reluctantly, Cyrus agrees, but on one condition, Abby must join their team. Intrigued by the upcoming job, the team is far from enthusiastic, convinced that it's a lost cause. However, their boss makes it clear, they either assist or face jail time. Just as tensions rise, Oliver, Denton, enters, recognizing that Interpol has them trapped, they reluctantly agree to listen to the agent's proposition. She reveals that in 17 days, Lars will move gold bars from a London bank to Zurich. The gold, packed in a 10-ton crate, will be transported under heavy guard by truck to Heathrow Airport, and then by a passenger flight to Zurich. Their task? Make the gold vanish during this journey. Despite the seemingly impossible task, they have no alternative but to agree. On the reservoir shore stands a single-story building. A man with a black dog approaches and enters. Inside, he greets the bound and suspended Arthur Tig. Drawing a knife, he cuts the rope, causing Arthur to hang upside down, and calls for Jorgensen. Lars is displeased with Arthur's talkative nature and instructs Cormac to feed him to the dog. Meanwhile, Cyrus is lounging when Abby confronts him for not assisting his team, who had been working tirelessly through the night. He jokes that she must have been a strict rule-following child. Abby shares a personal story from her school days. A valuable painting by Hockney was stolen, and she vowed to grow up and apprehend the thieves, leading her to a career with Interpol. Although she never found the culprits, the memory fuels her dedication. Observing Cyrus' reaction, she concludes he's attempting to flirt, recalling their encounter in Paris. She suspects he's trying to manipulate her once again. Cyrus defends his ethical code, claiming he never steals from the undeserving. He proposes a daring plan, not only to steal the gold but to hijack the passenger plane transporting it. To execute this, they'll need a private jet. After some research, Misun identifies a potential target in their database. Arriving at Mr. Molson's residence, the team requests to rent his unique plane. However, Molson is hesitant, describing the aircraft as a one-of-a-kind model developed by NASA and modified in ways that breach aviation laws. He proudly informs Abby that he's prohibited from flying it in the US but does so regardless. Amused by his confession, Abby reveals her law enforcement background and asserts that they will be taking his aircraft without interference. Molson gives them a tour of his prized plane, highlighting its impressive features, including a massive LED screen capable of displaying messages along the entire length of the fuselage. After transporting the aircraft to Interpol's hangar, the team begins preparations for the heist. Magnus devises a laser capable of cracking a safe in 10 minutes, but it's effective only on the ground. Airborne turbulence renders it useless. The boss suggests utilizing a Stuart platform stabilizer to overcome this issue. Meanwhile, Camilla struggles with piloting on a simulator. Cyrus offers to assist her, while Luke adjusts N8's cameras to stealth mode for external surveillance. Though uncertain, Luke agrees to give it a shot. Approaching Denton, they engage in a conversation. Denton warns the boss that agreeing to this risky venture is reckless, but it's too late to back out now. Denton recounts his past encounter with Abby in Paris, and despite the boss's attempts to downplay it, Denton discerns the lingering feelings between them. The boss insists that their differing lifestyles make them incompatible. 
As Luke works on making the plane invisible, Misun emphasizes the necessity of a jammer, portable signal suppression device, to block all outgoing signals from the aircraft. She has already ordered the necessary components, which are due to arrive the following day. However, there's a significant challenge. The probability of successfully launching jammers on two planes simultaneously is extremely low. If air traffic control notices this anomaly, their plan will be foiled. Cyrus proposes bribing the dispatcher, but there's another hurdle. The dispatcher must be located in Brussels. They lack a contact there, but Abby knows someone who might be able to help. In Brussels, Abby and Cyrus head to a pub where they meet Harry, a man in a wheelchair and their trusted informant whom they've relocated to Belgium for his safety. Over drinks, Abby and Cyrus explain that they need an insider in air traffic control to discreetly communicate with the pilots and overlook certain irregularities during their heist. Initially hesitant due to fears of losing his job and facing terrorism accusations, Harry declines the risky proposition. However, when Cyrus offers him $1 million, Harry agrees. He then asks Harry if he knows anyone capable of unloading cargo from an A380, to which Harry replies that he knows a couple of people. Just then, Abby receives a call from Dennis Haxley requesting a meeting. In a park rendezvous, Agent Dennis Haxley introduces himself to Cyrus and informs him that Arthur Tigg's body was discovered on the Irish coast, dismembered and distributed across six bags. Upon learning that Tigg was a former associate of Lars, the news shakes the team. Dennis further reveals that the heist is likely to occur in 10 days, not the previously anticipated 17. Frustrated by the shortened timeline and feeling unprepared, Cyrus contemplates backing out. However, Dennis threatens to revoke his immunity and prosecute him if he withdraws from the operation. Reluctantly, Cyrus agrees to proceed, primarily for Abby's sake. Back at the hangar, preparations for the heist are in full swing. The news broadcasts footage of a cyber terrorist attack on Madrid's main water supply system, resulting in widespread flooding, burst pipes, and 13 fatalities. The team recognizes Lars' handiwork and realizes that this attack is merely a precursor to his grand scheme, which is set to unfold in 10 days. Feeling overwhelmed by the accelerated timeline, the boss decides to bow out of the operation, opting to go it alone. However, the team stands united, expressing their loyalty and commitment to see the mission through to the end. In his opulent mansion, Lars watches the news coverage of the Madrid disaster and receives a call from a female voice confirming Leviathan's successful completion of the task. Pleased with the outcome, Lars gives the green light for the demonstration, stating that he's already preparing the gold for transport. Back at the hangar, Misun presents her completed jammer to the team. However, its appearance is problematic, it strongly resembles a bomb. Abby suggests disassembling the device, distributing its components among the team, and reassembling it onboard the plane. With everyone's approval, Misun conceals the jammer's parts in various everyday items, a hairdryer for Abby, a camera for Luke, and an intimate toy for Magnus. N8's cameras are detached from their casings and affixed to metal sheets to cover the plane discreetly. Concurrently, the team finalizes their plan. A skilled pilot will navigate the passenger liner, tasked with landing it on a remote snowy runway in the Alps. Camilla will send a drone to Zurich as a diversion while following the team to Cortina. Magnus aims to crack the safe within 10 minutes, but his best time to date is 11 minutes and 55 seconds. Upon landing, Harry's associates on the ground will transfer the gold to a waiting train. Interpol plans to intercept the train at the subsequent station to secure the stolen gold. As the team continues to shield the plane with metal sheets, Magnus successfully reduces his hacking time to 9 minutes and 38 seconds. Meanwhile, Camilla masters the art of piloting. With preparations complete, the team stands ready to execute the greatest heist of their lives. Heathrow Airport, London. Abby and Cyrus navigate through security, traveling first class while posing as a married couple. Nearby, one of Larcy's associates sits with them. Further back in the first-class cabin, Denton and Magnus, accompanied by several more of Larcy's people and Misun, settle into economy class. In the cargo hold, a secured area houses a large metal safe loaded with gold. The boss contacts his team to confirm their readiness and discovers that Luke is no longer in play. However, the hacker reveals that Luke still possesses a signal booster, meaning the device will function but only near the cockpit. Abby is summoned to transport the booster there and conceal it. Meanwhile, Misun, upon activating the computer, discovers they are under surveillance by two individuals in first class and three in economy. Camilla initiates the plane's engines and departs from the Interpol hangar. Once the airliner reaches its cruising altitude, the hacker abandons the computer and moves away, closely observed by Cormac. Magnus then rises from his seat. As the plane traverses the English Channel, dispatcher Harry warns of impending turbulence. The hacker heads towards the restroom and encounters Misun exiting. Simultaneously, Camilla accelerates and spots the passenger airliner on radar. Instructed by the hacker, Abby begins assembling the device. Collecting all the concealed components, she proceeds to the first-class restroom, 
constructs the device, and conceals it. However, as the plane hits turbulence, she fumbles and the device shatters into pieces. Alarmed, Cyrus approaches to check on her, witnessing the mishap. He quickly starts reassembling the device, with Camilla now closing in on them. Amidst the tension, someone knocks on the door, prompting Abby and Cyrus to feign a romantic encounter. The female pilot closes in dangerously, the onboard computer warning of an impending collision, yet she disregards it. She maneuvers beneath the passenger airliner, aligning with the connection point. In the control room, a technician spots two planes on the radar, but Harry dismisses it as a technical glitch. She stands firm on her observation. Seizing the moment, Harry feigns a personal grievance, suggesting her skepticism stems from bias against him due to his position. Distracted, she momentarily loses sight of the second plane on the radar. At that instant, Abby and Cyrus successfully assemble the device. As they exit the restroom, Cyrus plants a kiss on Abby. Harry contacts the passenger plane, fabricating bad weather conditions in Zurich and redirecting it to an airstrip in the Alps. He then radios Camilla, confirming the successful diversion. The passenger airliner alters its course, and the female pilot deploys a drone set to fly to Zurich, veering towards Cortina instead. The pilot informs the passengers of the change in destination, from Zurich to Cortina, arousing suspicion among Larcy's associates. Cyrus communicates with Denton and Magnus, signaling it's time to breach the vault. A man disguised as a grandfather distracts the flight attendant, allowing the hacker to descend into the cargo hold. Concurrently, the boss instructs me soon to jam external communications, leading her to disable the Wi-Fi. The mercenaries initiate their preparations. Inside the vault, Magnus sets to work on the safe. The initial attempt fails, but he eventually manages to crack it, beginning the process of unlocking the safe. The Larcy operatives spring into action, seizing a flight attendant as a hostage. One of them attempts to coerce her into persuading the pilots to redirect the plane to Zurich. Just as the plane encounters turbulence, Cyrus instigates a physical altercation, providing a distraction to buy Magnus more time. Abby intervenes, aiding the flight attendant. When a second adversary emerges, Abby swiftly incapacitates him, triggering a brawl. In the midst of the chaos, the hacker successfully cracks the safe. Once the scuffle above subsides, Abby and Cyrus decide to join their comrade to monitor the progress of the hacking. As the plane begins its descent, Cormac intercepts them, brandishing a firearm. The passenger airliner touches down on an icy runway, flanked by snowdrifts and ice. Camilla lands her aircraft shortly after. The mercenaries corral members of Cyrus's team near the storage area. Meanwhile, Larcy contacts Cormac, expressing his displeasure that his gold failed to reach Zurich. Cormac assures him, fabricating a story about a band of thieves attempting to pilfer the gold, claiming they have been apprehended. He then commands Cormac to deliver both the thieves and the gold to him within an hour. Observing her comrades being led onto the street at gunpoint, Camilla disembarks the plane. Cormac informs her of their new destination, Tuscany, along with the gold. The boss attempts to persuade Cormac, warning that the aircraft won't support such a heavy load. Ignoring the advice, Cormac orders the disposal of Magnus, and the mercenaries escort him away. Cortina Railway Station. A truck is parked on the platform, with Agent Huxley overseeing the operation. An assistant rushes up to him, reporting a call from Brussels. An attempt to breach the cockpit was thwarted by passengers, resulting in two of them being transferred to a private plane. The original airliner is now untraceable. Frustrated, Agent Huxley demands that they locate the missing plane immediately. Inside the plane's cabin, Cyrus and Abby are held at gunpoint by Cormac, with another mercenary standing guard over Camilla. Observing through the cameras that the metal sheets are failing to conceal the aircraft, Camilla decides to remove the protective coating. She maneuvers the plane erratically, causing the sheets to dislodge and rendering the airliner visible on radar. On the runway, a mercenary holds Magnus at gunpoint. A confrontation ensues, resulting in the hacker seizing the mercenary's gun, discharging it, and discarding it. Unaware of this, the mercenary retrieves the weapon and attempts to fire at Magnus, only for it to misfire, causing him to lose his fingers. Back at the control center, agents monitor the plane's trajectory towards Italy on a radar-equipped tablet. Without concrete evidence, they are unable to contact the Carabinieri. Agent Huxley orders them to contact NATO to intercept and shoot down the unidentified aircraft, deeming it a terrorist threat. Jorgensen must not acquire the gold. Two NATO fighter jets soar into the sky. At Larcy's villa, Leviathan arrives to claim the gold. The girl warns that she will cancel the deal and obliterate all accounts if the terms are not met. The military jets close in on the team's plane. Harry spots them on the radar and urgently requests contact with NATO. Approaching the airliner, the military pilots attempt to communicate, warning that without a response, they will be compelled to use artillery. Harry informs the NATO dispatcher that the plane is a private aircraft carrying civilians. The military contacts Huxley, who acknowledges the new information but still orders the plane to be shot down. 
The dispatcher communicates the directive to the pilots. The fighter pilots give the airliner 60 seconds to respond, otherwise, they will engage. In a desperate bid, Cyrus initiates a brawl to distract the mercenaries, while Abby manipulates the control panel to broadcast a message. Understanding their ploy, Camilla maneuvers the plane erratically. The military intercepts the message, civilians are aboard the plane. The dispatcher rescinds the shoot-down order and informs Huxley of the new intelligence. The skirmish intensifies in the cabin. A mercenary returns to the cockpit, coercing Camilla to flip the plane. Resisting fiercely, she sustains several powerful blows but devises a different strategy. Regaining control, she abruptly pitches the plane downward. Caught off guard, the assailant lurches forward, colliding with the instrument panel and losing consciousness. The aircraft plunges rapidly. Abby seizes the controls and opens the doors, while Cyrus ejects Cormac from the plane. Upon entering the cockpit, Abby and Cyrus find Camilla nursing a broken wrist. She guides them on how to stabilize and land the plane, but suddenly a panel from the fuselage detaches, damaging the hydraulics. Larcy's villa looms ominously in the distance. Struggling to control the aircraft, they opt for an emergency landing on the road below. Larcy and the girl watch in horror as the plane hurtles toward them at high speed. The plane barrels down the road, plowing through obstacles and finally coming to a rest on its side, with a crate of gold tumbling out. As they emerge onto the street, they are immediately surrounded by armed men. Disguised, Cyrus signals instructions to me soon. Larcy and the girl approach the group. She is incensed, having been told that one of these three is an Interpol agent, signaling the end of their deal. In a fit of rage, Larcy kills her, demanding to know the identity of the agent. Cyrus takes the brunt of the assault. At that moment, the police swarm the scene. They encircle the group. Larcy tries to defend himself, but Misun reveals she recorded the entire incident through the plane's fuselage cameras, broadcasting the footage on the plane's screen. Larcy is promptly arrested. Agent Gladwell returns to her team, only to discover that Huxley had ordered the plane to be shot down, fully aware she was on board. Slapping him across the face, she resigns and approaches Cyrus. A couple of weeks later, the man and the woman are driving in a car. Along the way, he reveals that he has located and repurchased the painting stolen from the school. Furthermore, they did manage to steal the gold after all. She is puzzled, having been with him throughout the entire ordeal. He explains that while recruiting Harry, Magnus had been repainting iron bars to resemble gold. These were then placed in the cargo hold. After cracking the safe, Magnus swapped the crates, jettisoning the genuine gold. Luke hadn't abandoned them, his mission was to safely land the gold. Upon reaching the lake, they warmly greet the team and retrieve the crate submerged in the water. Cyrus and Abby share a heartfelt kiss. Share your thoughts in the comments below. Hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. See you in the next videos.